everybody. Thank you for joining me once again, where today we're going to deal with this jolly Randall cycle thing, which uh, many of you will have heard me speak about before on my other fine, fine YouTube channel. It occurs to me, and it's confirmed by many people saying to me that they really need a better explanation of this particular cycle in order to understand exactly what's going on here and to get why it is that I have repeatedly said that a mixed macronutrient diet is likely to be problematic for people, will lead to weight gain, will lead to a tendency to become obese over a lifetime, will lead to chronic systemic inflammation, heart disease, and all the sequelae involved with that. So as such, it is my pleasure today to give my best effort at explaining the Randall cycle to you in what is hopefully a more accessible uh, manner than perhaps hitherto. So here we go. The cycle proposed, put forward, and confirmed as in existence by Randall way back when. Let's have a look at it. Basically, the Randall cycle for a too long didn't watch version, for those that just want the quick answer, well, you can look at any number of my videos, but basically the quick answer is this. If you have a lot of glucose and also a lot of fat in your bloodstream, all trying to get into your cells, then the fat will inhibit the ability of the cell to metabolize sugar, and the sugar will inhibit the cell's ability to metabolize fat. So in other words, they will cross blockade one another. This is a problem that only comes into play when the effective number of calories existing in the blood at that time is in excess of the amount the cell can effectively use, oxidize for energy at that time. So pretty much any time you eat a bolus of food, if that food is of a mixed macronutrient nature, in other words, it has a fair amount of carbohydrate as well as a fair amount of fat in it, then the fat will blockade the carbohydrate and the carbohydrate will blockade the fat. Here is the mechanism by which that occurs. As I say, it is called the Randall cycle. Let's look at two situations, an A situation and a B situation. So the A situation is when you have a high concentration of glucose in the bloodstream. Or if you have any amount of glucose in the bloodstream and very little fat in the bloodstream at that time. In either case, the A situation will be what is occurring in the cell. The blue area at the top of the screen is the extracellular fluids. The blood, basically, is what we're talking about here. The tan-colored area in the middle of the screen there is the intracellular compartment, the cell cytosol inside the cell. And the green area at the bottom is inside the mitochondria, where acetyl coenzyme A is reacted in the in the cycle to produce ATP plus carbon dioxide plus water plus energy basically okay so let's start at the top left of the situation a where we have a great deal of glucose or indeed any amount of glucose with no fat in the bloodstream the GLUT4 transporter on the cell membrane, the GLUT4 transporter up here, 
senses that there is glucose in the blood for transportation into the cell, and so it does so. Where the reactions begin and we end up with a glucose 6 phosphate or fructose 6 phosphate, basically. And then we have two enzymes, phosphofructokinase 1 and phosphofructokinase 2. Um, PFK1 leads directly to fructose 1, 6 biphosphate, and then the PFK reaction has another route where we end up with fructose 2, 6 phosphate, which then uh, is transmuted so that we end up with fructose 1, 6 biphosphate. Yeah. Okay. Then what we end up is with a series of reactions leading to an accumulation of pyruvate inside the cell cytosol. And pyruvate is then transported into the mitochondria on a monocarboxylate transporter where there are another series of enzymes which make up a complex called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex which lead directly to a production inside the mitochondria of acetyl coenzyme A, which is the first intermediary of the tricarboxylic acid TCA or Krebs cycle, if you like. That's the one that produces the energy, the carbon dioxide, uh, and the water, and the, and the ATP It comes out of, of all of that. Okie dokie. So in that case... Bunch of sugar pours into the cell, pours through into the mitochondria, means that there's a great deal of acetyl coenzyme A suddenly produced, more than the cell can use for energy at that instant, at that time, because the cell doesn't need that energy. And so what happens is the acetyl coenzyme A feeds into the Krebs cycle, which forces it around and produces an accumulation of one of the byproducts of the TCA cycle, which is called citrate, which um, is the the anion component of citric acid, actually, if, if, if you're interested in, in what that is. It's a simple molecule, and it diffuses out of the mitochondria because of its accumulation into the cell cytosol, here, where another enzyme called ATP citrate lyase or something like that from memory, then transmutes it into acetyl coenzyme A in the cell cytosol. And then there is another enzyme called ACC, uh, acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, I believe from memory, which then produces a, a product inside the cell cytosol called melanol coenzyme A. Melanol coenzyme A, as you can see here by the, the T-shaped symbol there, that means blockade. So an increasing concentration of melanol coenzyme A blockades a transporter down here called CPT1. CPT1 is the enzyme that would move long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A molecules from the cell cytosol into the mitochondria, which would then undergo beta oxidation and produce acetyl coenzyme A. Now, given that we've already got lots of co acetyl coenzyme A, which is then pouring out into citrate, citrate leaks out into the cell, citrate is transmuted into acetyl coenzyme A there, and then melanol coenzyme A. That then directly blockades that enzyme, which stops the right-hand side of the equation proceeding. In other words, the fat cannot get into the cell to be oxidized. As such, the, the buildup of long-chain fatty acyl coenzyme A molecules then lead to a production of triglycerides, fat storage. Okay, so that is situation A. Glucose predominates, fat is blockaded from entering the energy production machinery, and thus fat is stored as triglycerides.
That's why if you eat any amount of sugar, really, you are placing your body in a situation where, or any, any carbohydrates, really, which will break down to glucose, then you are basically asking for fat storage to predominate. You are asking to become fatter and fatter over a lifetime. And that is why you will find people on a mixed macronutrient diet which is rich in both carbohydrate and fatty acids, will tend to get fatter and fatter over the years. Incredible. Um, so that's that's the situation A, where glucose predominates and fat is blockaded. Let's now, without too much further ado, move to situation B, where fat predominates and thus glucose is blockaded. Okay. If you have a large amount of fat and a lower amount of glucose in the bloodstream, then we're going to get situation B, where the CD36 transporter will move the long-chain fatty acids into the cell. They will be transmitted into long-chain fatty acyl coenzyme A units, which will then activate the CPT1 transporter, which was blockaded by the glucose previously. And that will move the long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A units into the mitochondria, where beta oxidation will transmute them into acetyl coenzyme A. There will be several other things that will occur as a, as a result of that. Number one, if the acetyl coenzyme A concentration becomes rather high, then the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is blockaded and pyruvate cannot feed into acetyl coenzyme A, thus causing the left-hand side of the equation to be blockaded. But if the situation is that there is a lot of fat available, then we will get the citrate pouring out of the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria, which will then leach into the cell cytosol. And citrate in large concentrations will also blockade phosphofructokinase reactions, and also the GLUT4 transporter directly, thus blockading sugar from entering the cell, allowing the fat to predominate, but also causing the blood glucose level to rise and rise and rise and rise. So basically what you have is a situation where there are aspects of this whole cycle where glucose inhibits fat and fat inhibits glucose. So anytime you have spare energy in the form of fat and glucose in the blood, neither one is able to get into the cell to feed the acetyl coenzyme A requirements effectively. And so you get, therefore, a reduction in the oxidative uh, potential of the cell as per the mitochondrial oxidative potential, and thus you get an increase in the concentration of inorganic phosphate inside the mitochondria, which then causes the same thing to occur in the cell cytosol. And what you will find is that an increased concentration of inorganic phosphate in the cells directly activates the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So that is why they say that the storage of energy is always associated with inflammation. And if you are unable to oxidize the energy for, for, for ATP, in the cell because both are blockaded because you eat a diet which is rich in both fat and glucose, uh, fat and glucose, yeah, fat and carbohydrate, then you're going to be chronically inflamed. You're going to be chronically storing fat because you can only store so much sugar before it then starts to, to be transmuted into fat as well. And so we get fatter and fatter and more and more chronically, systemically inflamed over years leading to obesity, leading to type 2 diabetes, leading to heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, leading to many forms of dementia and early death, basically. So what is the answer? Well, 
The answer is to consume a diet which is not rich in both carbohydrates and fats. Choose one of those diets. Choose a diet which is either rich in carbohydrates and not in fats, or a diet which is rich in fats but not in carbohydrates. Which one of those diets should you choose? Well, this one's very, very simple. One of those diets contains everything that you require to be healthy and to live a long life, and that is the diet based on animal products. That is the diet based on meat and animal fat with very, very minimal carbohydrate-containing material in it. There are no deficiencies that human beings suffer as a result of eating only the flesh and fat of animals. Unfortunately, the same is not true of a diet which is rich in carbohydrates, a plant-based diet, but not rich in fats. There are many, many nutrients that human beings require on a daily basis, which can only be found in biologically available, effective form in animal products. So that makes the choice easy. Also, we just go and look at what human beings have been consuming in their diet for the last 350,000 years as humans and indeed for approximately two and a half to three million years prior to that as well. The nitrogen-14, nitrogen-15 isotope testing that has been done on the skeletal remains of humans and nearly humans tells us the answer to that question. It tells us that that people have indeed been eating almost exclusively animals and not plants in any significant amount at all for the best part of three million years. So those are the genes selected for by positive selection pressures. Those are the organ systems that we have in place. That is the metabolic system that we have in place. We are simply not designed to run on both glucose and fats as shown here in the Randall cycle explanation. So I hope that was useful. Do join me next time when I will explain some other aspect of science, hopefully in a uh, accessible format. Let me know how I did on the Randall cycle here. If you have any questions, let me have them and I'll do my very best to answer those either in writing or indeed by making another video if that's required. See you then.